Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is how to write when you don't feel like writing. But before we go into today's topic, just like every week, we're going to go ahead and discuss what we got done this week. Holly? Uh, It was a pretty good week for me. Um, I worked on Moon and Sun, got my words on that. I worked on Dead Man's Party, got my words on that. Uh, worked on the Wishbone Conspiracy. I did not get my words on that because I had, well, it's okay. This has a happy ending. Um, I realized that, uh, I was, I had stopped outlining and had just started running with the book because that's a lot of fun. And then I hit a space where I realized I was going in the wrong direction so, um, yeah, I got uh, Thursday's words mostly. Friday, uh, I just sat down and outlined. And I have the entire novel now outlined in line for scene. And um, I know wow. that it's going where I need it. Yeah, wow. Well, it, it took hours and thinking and getting up and pacing back and forth and bouncing shit off myself and trying to, to come up with good conflicts and, you know, my, my usual physical process of coming up with story. <laughs> but um, it, it turned out well. And I got lesson 26 of how to write a novel done. And I have been blogging my progress on my various stuff on my blog. So uh, hollylyle.com and just go to the front page and you can find the blog link from there if you're interested in seeing how this has been going. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like a behind the scenes well, it is a behind the scenes. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I, I haven't done any screenshots or anything recently. I haven't done any little outtakes and stuff that I've posted because um, I've also been, along with this, I have been doing a massive amount of research in how to uh, get back to writing four or more books a year and promoting them and uh, publishing them and, you know, this whole thing of yeah well if you want to do this then god damn it do it and uh, yeah so what's great is that you're always able to when you learn something you're able to put it into a way that other people can see so at least other people are going to benefit as well yeah well this is the one part of the puzzle that i really i really never got into when i went indie i never looked at okay well how do i then get the numbers that people who are who are you know hard on just straight straight in their indie working as hard as they can how are they making a full-time living at this and um i kind of fell down on that i didn't look and so uh at the point where i looked at it and said well yeah you know i i have the writing classes and those are a job but i want my fiction back and I can have my fiction back and I have proven now to myself that I can produce the words to write at a pace that will allow me to do this now I'm having to do all of the other stuff so that that was a yeah big, that was a big sidetrack this week um <laughs> I'm tired yeah but it's one that's gonna hopefully pay off yeah yeah and at the point where I actually you know am am back to making a full-time living from my fiction again um, that'll probably be a class too. <laughs> so very cool. Yeah. So how about you? Oh, well, I got, um, Monday through Thursday, I got my writing done. I got more than I had expected. I went pretty much, I think I'm about halfway through the story that I'm writing right now. Um, I have a plan that I put in place to take a lot of my older stories and, revamp them just kind of go through like a bug hunt like you monday through thursday i did very well i got you know everything done i was very excited friday hit and i just felt like crap and i didn't know what was going on i'd already been sick for a few days thanks to tony and then it got way worse way way faster or way way worse way fast (laughs) so yeah um going through a little bit of a stomach virus but i'm hoping to at least get back to the words on monday yeah that's uh, yeah well i think you did great considering you were sick for the week the whole week you were sick yeah well, and, i mean I, I 
I started getting sick. What was it? Uh, last week. Mm-hmm. It seemed to be fine. It seemed to be going away. And then all of a sudden it was like, nope, fuck you. <laughs> There's more to this story. And Tony, I know he thought I was exaggerating. I know he thought, you know, like, because I am I do tend to be melodramatic and I don't deal with sickness or pain well. <laughs> you know, people make fun of guys for being big babies. No. In this relationship, Tony is that still that stoic kind of person and I am the big baby when I get sick. <laughs> But I got so sick, I was throwing up and throwing up, and and um, I finally told him, I'm like, this is really bad, you know, I'm, I'm like about to pass out. I need, to, I'm either calling an ambulance or you're gonna have to come get me. And then he came and got me, and we went to the hospital. And still, I think he thought I was exaggerating until I threw up in front of him, and it was like three solid minutes of just throwing up into this little baggie that they give you, <laughs> and I could hear him, and it, it, he, he's gotten better. Um, I guess because he's an EMT now, he can handle other people throwing up without mm-hmm. wanting to vomit himself. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I might just cut all of this out. I don't yeah. know. Mark, uh, Matt, Matt can't do barf. He can't do barf. He, he, has, he yeah. has to leave the room. Yeah, see, Tony used to be the same way because I used to vomit all the time because of the cramps. Mm-hmm. But now he just stood there and he was like, uh, he's not, he's got a real bad bedside manner. It's almost like a doctor. <laughs> oh, God. It's almost like he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But I know that he does because he feels really bad when I'm in pain and stuff. It's just he's got the most horrible bedside manner. But he's there, you yeah. know. Yeah. He left work. And then after he dropped me back off at home, four hours later, he went back to work. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, but yeah, I was actually really, really glad that I threw up in front of him. Because it's like, ha. See, Proof. I am, yes. That There you go. Three minutes of solid barfing. <laughs> Well, you and the nurse were just standing there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that was my week. Can't wait to get back to um, writing and not being projectile vomit sick. <laughs> okay. So the topic today is how to write when you don't feel like writing. And I think that this is really, really important. This is one of the more important things that um, that you can do to distinguish yourself from the amateur phase to the professional phase. And I think this was a really good idea for you to for us to do a podcast on yeah yeah well um this isn't this is not even at the point where you want to look at it as a job this is just at a point where you want to find out if you could could ever look at it as yeah if you could ever look at fiction as a job this is there is a make or break point when you have to say okay well if i really want to do this what do i have to do to do this um and you have to be able to write regularly that's just it's it, if you want to make writing your pay the bills day job you have to show up for work and if you don't show up for work your ass is going to get fired and that's the same for writing fiction as for anything else the only problem is that you're going to have to fire yourself when you aren't making any money so yeah. <laughs> um so let's look at this um writing is supposed to be fun it's supposed to be exciting it's supposed to be joyful at least most of the time there are always going to be bad days um, you know, I had one on the second half of Thursday and a, a good part of Friday where I was just stuck on the wishbone conspiracy until I realized, well, um, I'm not following my system. Uh, and at that point, uh, I got myself back in, on gear. But it's supposed to be fun. And if you hate writing, don't consider it as a job. Don't consider this as a possible future because you really have to enjoy it. Uh, you have to enjoy the process of sitting by yourself in a room with your fingers moving on a keyboard, producing words for hours at a time. And this is this is the you know the the goofy name for our podcast: alone in a room with invisible people. You have to like that. You have to be you have to be someone who, when you're standing in the bathroom looking in the mirror, um, you are talking to. Or you are arguing with people in your head, um, because that's part of, that's part of where fiction comes from, is uh, t- running through old arguments and in your yep. head winning them, and then figuring, hey, that could actually go into a story. I could win that argument on paper. <laughs> yeah, in, in the shower, cleaning up, anything, or you're pretending to be your characters. Yeah, and you're talking out loud, and your cats are staring at you. Yep. Yep, yep. There's there's a whole bunch of weird that goes into this. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing any of this shit, you're not crazy. Yes. And 
If you are not having fun now, the very first thing you have to do is ask yourself, why isn't it fun now, right now? What is it that you are doing that is not fun? And if it is the actual process of messing around in your head with invisible people, well, that's the job description and you should not be considering being a writer if that isn't fun for you. If you don't yeah. like arguing with people in while you're taking a shower, <laughs> um, then that's, so always ask that question. Am I having fun now? If it isn't fun, why isn't it fun now? And then if it's just that you don't like that, that's, that is a stopper. But everything else you can work with. Um, there are some possible related answers to this. One of them is, well, I don't know where I'm going. That was my problem last week, was that I had run off the rails. And I had not followed my process. Uh, I had not done a line for scene outline for the book. I had started it that way. And then I had just gotten so sucked up in the fun of writing and, and getting words on the page that I skipped a few chapters of outlining. And when I did that, I took a little wrong turn and ended up in a place that was not the book I wanted to write. So I don't know where I'm going is a problem that has a solution, which is that you have to ask, where am I going? Um, where am I going is a big deal. I, I know you had some... some. Well, I've, yeah, I've had a whole bunch of those. Uh, Glass House, I think, was the biggest, the biggest kind of show of that. <laughs> um, I had started out just originally intending it to be a romantic paranormal story one of the many to get into um i had planned like a series of five that i would write in the fulton hills area so originally it kind of started out there and then after i was done plotting it was going to start off um in standing river <laughs> <laughs> and then as i was writing it i didn't want it to be a romance anymore you know i, I could see how they would hook up Maybe in the future, but maybe not. And then <laughs> this kept going. <laughs> and originally I kind of figured out I, I wanted it to be a seven book series and then have um, a prequel. So that would be like eight books. And having to do that with the little plotting that I did was why I ended up doing the octopus map with you. Mm -hmm. And it just <laughs> not knowing where I was going, but using that that theory of well when you figure it out right keep going forward as if the entire book that you've written so far had been written with that that intention with that in mind helped me many times to move past what i had changed or move past what i i you know had done wrong and not feel like having to go back so I just kept moving forward with the with the changes that I had written down, and I was able to finish the book. Now, though, I have this book, <laughs> yeah, that is um, going to be an interesting revision, to say the least. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's well. Dead Man's Party is going to be that for me for the same reason. It started being one thing, turned into something else, turned into a third thing, and now is a fourth thing. It's hard, it's hard to describe when you don't know where you're going with something. It is. Yeah. 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 The, the, because if you, if you could describe it, you would know where you were going. Yeah. The next thing is I don't like where I'm going. Okay. So you have, I don't know where I'm going, in which case you ask, where am I going? I don't like where I'm going. And the question that is associated with that is where could I go instead? And... Uh, my example for this one is Dead Man's Party, where uh, I was writing a story post-apocalyptic that was about 10 years, I think, after the apocalypse. And I had these two people who were in love with each other and who had not been able to reconnect in 10 years. And I kept, I kept plugging along on it but 
all of a sudden you realize, well, if he hasn't found, if he, if she told him where she was going to be and he hasn't found her in 10 years, he's really dumb. Um, and, or he doesn't love her. Yeah. Or he doesn't love her, but I know that he does because that's, that was the thing that changed the world was the fact that he loved her is what brought on the apocalypse. Um, and he still loves her. So I had to go back through and ask myself, well, where could I go with this where the majority of my main characters are not just too stupid to live? TSTL, that's something you have to keep in mind is, is this character too stupid to live? And I had three out of four main characters who were. That's not a good ratio. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at it and I went, okay, but... I love the story. I love the artifact I built for it. I love the world. I love what I'm getting. What if I just bumped it back to two years after the apocalypse and give them a really horrific problem that um, I've been kind of ignoring now? So the cannibal zombies came from that. And there are the cannibals and the zombies. They were two separate things. And also... Um, the fact that they haven't found each other yet is now because of the cannibals and the zombies and the fact that they were separated by a significant amount of, of stuff and technology doesn't work and they haven't managed to get stuff back. And all of a sudden, everything clicks and nobody's stupid. Um, so what, where could I go with it is a big deal. Have you had anything like that? Yeah, when I first started writing um, Silver Lining, the screenplay, that I had um, when I was 16 and I finished when I was 17, my very first uh, finished screenplay. Yeah, that one, that one I had. <laughs> well, you're also 16 writing a screenplay, so a lot of it is probably from, from being that young. But um, the main character was a guy whose um, brother was kidnapped and held for ransom because he owed a lot of money to a loan shark. So, yeah, and, and then it was also a love story. But I kept making mistakes in it that, like, it was either... There was too much violence between the main character and the love interest. It's like, because he ends up having to kidnap her for something. I think he thinks she has a lot of money. I haven't read this thing in a long time. <laughs> And there was, like, too much violence, and I'm like, um, that's not going to work if this is supposed to also be a romance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then it was also, like, he was too weak at a lot of points, and then she was, she was way too weak at a lot of points. And I'm like, no, I don't like weak bitches. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to do a lot of saving for that one. And then the brother who ended up being kidnapped, um, he died in one version, and I'm like, no, that's pointless. It's so stupid. <laughs> So, yeah, it it's again, it's it's just when you're not liking what you're writing, mm -hmm. definitely that can kill your drive to write. Yeah, you don't really want to feel like writing anymore. <laughs> so yeah. You got to fix it. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, so then the third one is and, and this is a big one. I don't care where I'm going. Yeah. And the question here is what could I change to make me care? And not caring where you're going means that you have lost the point of your story. So you have to go back to your characters and their conflict, whatever it is. What do they need to accomplish that matters to you in this story? Are they, <clears throat> are they going to, do they have to fall in love? Uh, do they have to escape a serial killer? Do they have to save the world? What do your characters have to do that matters to you. If it doesn't matter to you, you're writing the wrong story. And I have done this a few times. I have gotten started on something that seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, it was a popular genre or it yeah. was, yeah. Or it was something where, um, there I have, I have recently read some very good books about writing to market and um, <laughs> the, the thing about it is you have to make sure that you like the market. 
because uh, it, it's all well and good to say, well, you know, I want to write romance novels. But if you don't read romance novels and if you don't love romance novels, then that's not the market you should be trying to write in. Um, yeah, because eventually, I mean, you're not going to give a shit. And that's the cool thing about, like, with your, your writing sci-fi. And if you wanted to do a, a fantasy novel or, or a series, you actually like the fantasy novel. Oh, God, fantasy. Yes genre so you could jump back in there without a problem even though sci-fi is what you actually love Mm -hmm. so yeah and i think a lot of people look at the romance especially if they're looking at indie because a it's just you know two people falling in love they have these little fights they have a lot of sex i can write that but a lot of the times if you don't give a shit it comes across in your writing yeah and if you you don't care you're not going to see the sales and you're going to not understand what went wrong right yeah no and and i i loved romantic suspense paranormal (laughs) that which is not a genre it's kind of a melding of things that i love every single one of them had had paranormal romance and suspense and with that melding of stuff um i loved what i was writing and yeah i got good sales for them but i did not get great enough sales that I built a readership over the four books that I had, so uh, they did not renew the contract, and I moved on. Um, So I could go back and write that, because I put romance in everything, uh, because falling in love with each other is what people do that gives their lives, is part of what gives their lives meaning, is is finding someone in the world who matters to you. Mm -hmm. But... I am incapable of making that my sole story. I cannot just write romance. I have to have bigger stuff going on too so that my characters are on the same side because I can't do the conflict being the romance itself. I I, I am incapable of doing that. I have tried. I have failed. Um, So you have to look at what could you bring to this story to make it work for you? And for me, I have to throw in, to make a romance work, I have to throw in science fiction elements or fantasy elements or paranormal elements or all of those and tie them, lump them all into books that are about some big conflict that people can fall in love while trying to solve. And, uh, and not, I, I, have, I have romances or some version of romance in I think every book I've written but they aren't romance novels they are they are people who find each other while solving other stuff and that's the thing that works for me and was there one in when the bow breaks (sighs) was there I don't know that's the only one I don't really remember that well yeah there might not have been in that one no there was there was a the, the the my two main characters had a thing for each other, and uh, the elf and the human. Okay. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and then she she kicked him to the curb when he wanted to uh, erase her memories so that she wouldn't know about elves anymore when they had to say goodbye. So and yeah, <laughs> yeah. I said no, no. We're not going to do the Superman ending. <laughs> yeah, where you take a portion of my life. Screw that. Yeah, I found. I mean, the only thing I was going to add was the same thing that you said, which is, um, don't, it, ha- it tends to happen when you're writing something that you just think you're going to make money at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, it, that tends to be the problem is when people focus on, well, this makes big, bu- big bucks. I'm a good writer. I can write this and make money. Then you, you're just not going to care. Mm-hmm. You might think that, you know, oh, well, I'm a good enough writer. It won't show up. But I mean... Even if you get readers for the first book or two that you're writing, I mean, you're talking about doing a life-long career as somebody writing something that you don't genuinely love. Why not just go work at a retail job or go work at a business job? Go find a 9-to-5 somewhere because that's basically the same exact thing. Right. You just get to stay at home and, and... Honestly, like, you, you get more interaction with other people. If you go work at a job somewhere, yeah. you get better 
um, financial security in the short run because you know you're going to be getting paid. <laughs> you know, maybe even in the long run. I mean, you know where your money is coming from. And if you're a good enough worker, then and you're writing something that you don't feel passionate about, <laughs> go get a nine to five because it's the exact same thing. Right, right. That's the, the whole point of writing fiction is that you love to write fiction and you want to get paid for doing what you love. Yeah, if it's too hard not... of a job oh and too God. little of pay for you to sit there and think, oh, well, this is going to be easy. And you know what? You're, if you're one of the very millions of people that thinks you're going to be the next Harry Potter writer or you're going to be the next, um, I don't know, uh, what, what's her name again? The one that wrote Twilight? I don't remember. Yeah, so if, if you, Meyer. Minor. Yeah, so Stephanie. I mean, you think you're going to be uh, this big famous writer or something? I'm going to say to 99.9 percent of you, that's not going to happen. Yeah, even if, if the were... percentage is way smaller than that, way yeah. smaller. Well, I'm just, I <laughs> yeah. mean, to, you're being to generous. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it, you will have better financial security at least in the short run because I mean. Even big companies go under and they fire people for no reason, yada, yada, yada. But you're going to get paid on a more regular basis if you go get a 9 to 5 job because this is not easy. This is a hard, hard job. This is hard work. This is dedication and commitment. And it takes a lot, to, especially if you think you're, like, if you're looking at commercial publishing. Look at all the shit Holly had to go through. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. So it just always pisses me off when people say, like that writing is or, or say or think that writing is a way out or a way to financial freedom or a way to um fame yeah. you know you, <laughs> it, it is it is a way to express yourself it is a way to reach people out there that might be your people that maybe that you can make feel not so alone and it is a way to to create a career but it's not easy. Right. Right. And it is. Uh, but but <clears throat> that's, that is the dark side. The bright side is if you do love to write, you get to wake up every morning going, hot shit, I get to go to work today. Yeah, but we're talking about I don't care. Right. That was, that was the point. Is right. That, if, you if you don't, don't care, yeah, that's you are. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't. Either pick do. something else to write or pick another job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Find something you care about. And then, you know, go through the stuff on how to write to market. If, if this is where you want to make this a full-time job, um, and there are some resources that we can put on the notes. I'll, I'll give Becky the list of books that I've been reading so that she can add them because I have found them really helpful. But um, find what you care about and make that fit. Okay, so... With those three, those allow you to stop and plan at least a little bit ahead in your story. Um, you can ask and answer the questions. You can get your story back on track. You can stay focused. You can find the things that you love. You can make yourself care. Um, you can f figure out where you're going, and you can figure out what you love. And, and that will all work. Now, there are some answers uh, that writing can help solve. One of those is... I'm unhappy, uh, and if and this goes back to what Becky was saying, if writing makes you happy, if you enjoy it, if you like arguing with your invisible people in your head, and coming up with cool solutions to problems, and putting people in strange places and having weird shit happen to them, and making this something fun, then this is going to be great for you. Um, it can solve I'm unhappy, if you enjoy this same process, it can also solve I'm bored. Because there is nothing like creating a cliffhanger and then not knowing how you're going to end it and running your character right up to the cliff going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what's going to happen now? And then having your little right brain muse click in there and go, ha, 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 here's what happens next. That's a blast. That is just crazy, crazy fun and something that I love beyond words. And one of the things that makes me so damn happy to get out of bed in the morning and get my little five-minute shower and haul ass to get into work is because I get to do that as a job, and it's wonderful. If, 
you know, if this makes you happy, then writing is the solution to I'm unhappy and I'm bored. Um, now, there are some things that writing fiction won't fix. And, uh, and there are some things that when you don't feel like writing and you just don't care, you, you just, sometimes it's not you. <laughs> Well, sometimes yeah, or sometimes it is. It can be depression. Yeah, which, yeah, which is way different than yeah. I don't care. Be, be, that's basically I don't care about anything, and that you need to see somebody for. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big deal. That is, I can't. I don't even want to get out of bed in the morning. Um, I, I I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. I'm just going to lie here until the world falls in on top of me. That's a bad place to be. I have been there. Becky's been there. Um, yeah, that's, that's a get help phase. If you're sick, <clears throat> writing is not going to work well because yeah. it requires energy and enthusiasm and creativity and, uh, throwing up for three minutes at a time <laughs> is, is not something that's going to allow you to be creative. It's just, sometimes you've got to give yourself a break. You, if you're exhausted, if, um, you head to work uh, back to back 14 hour shifts because somebody didn't show up for their shift. And, uh, <clears throat> you, and then you have to roll over the next day and come in early this, the next morning to pick up you. So you ran the, you know, the day shift plus half of the night shift, plus you rolled in after, uh, six hours to come back in to do work again, which I did a couple of times when I was a nurse and it sucked. Um, you aren't going to write the next day because you're just going to lie there panting on the floor, um, to, trying to recover. Uh, I, a clinically depressed counts. I'm on meds that block my creativity. Um, this is one where if you, if you, um, were creative, you started taking the meds, your creativity just disappeared. Um, for me, Prozac did that. And you just, you suddenly, you cannot write. That's something that you either have to talk to your doctor about well, no, you have to talk to your doctor about that uh, because there might be alternative medication that you can take or alternative treatments that you could do that would allow you to get your creativity back, and that's a big deal. Um, I don't like to write. <laughs> uh, writing is not going to fix I don't like to write. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, even if, if you have this identity in your head of yourself as a writer, but you don't find yourself sitting down to actually do it. Or when you do sit down to actually do it, you allow yourself constant distractions or, and, and the constant distractions, that's something we all deal with. But I'm saying add all of this together. If, if your ideas are always in your head and that's where they stay and you can't put them on paper because, or, you know, um, computer, right. <laughs> if you can't, if you can't get your ideas down because you're just bored with the actual work, then you're not a writer. Right. And there are so many people. There is this huge category of people who have had someone tell them, oh, my God, you're so good. You should be a writer. Yeah. And Or you should be an artist. Or you or, should be uh, yeah. an artist. Or you should be a musician. Um, you should tell them where they can stick it. If you don't like the work... Or then, don't be so rude and say, thank you, I appreciate it, but it's not my kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the nice way of going about it. But I have seen so many people who have carried around this massive guilt, this, this huge burden of guilt that they're not using their talent, that they have this talent that they were given, and it's their duty to use it because someone told them they were given this talent and it's their duty to use it. And the answer to that is not a polite thank you. It is fuck you. If you want to be a writer, you write. I don't enjoy the work. And you're allowed to say that. You are allowed to say, no, I, I did never want to be a writer. Somebody told me uh, that this was my gift and it was my duty to, 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 to no. No. I don't know anybody like that, though. I know people that maybe, like, um, I don't want to mention her name, but we, we used to go to school, and she she used to write, like, um, she she was writing, like, these, these um, not 
it was kind of like Shakespeare stuff. Mm -hmm. It wasn't poems and it wasn't stories, but it was just like, it w it was stories, but it was more in like the, the Shakespeare, I forget what it's called. Iambic pentameter. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And um, she was writing those things and she used to love it and she loved it so much. And she today feels guilty because she doesn't still write. She's like, I used to love it so much and blah, blah, blah. And if you grow out of it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. If it was something that you loved and you don't anymore. And I, I've told her this before and she says, oh, okay, well, thank you. I feel better. And then a few <laughs> months later or whatever, she feels guilty again because she can't let go of that identity. Yeah. And if you loved writing, you know, a long time ago and you don't anymore, that's okay too. It's It's like... This this is not meant to be the the um don't write episode of this <laughs> podcast, but the point of it is is like the whole episode is about how to write when you don't feel like writing. Sometimes you shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, that's we have identities that we build for ourselves when we are young that allow us to get through some portion of our life. Um, I was absolutely certain that I was going, either going to be a professional artist or a rock god. Um, I, you know, I, and guitar, writing, playing the guitar and writing songs when I was 15, 16, 17, 18 years old got me through some real shit in my life. It really helped me. I, I was able to work through issues that I had to deal with from all of the crap that had happened in earlier parts of my life and put them into poetry and write depressing minor chord songs about them. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I was going to, I was going to make a career of that. And then I discovered that a, you had to actually be a hell of a lot better at that than I was to make a career of it. And B, I didn't care enough by the time I was old enough to get out on my own to want to do that work. I just didn't care. It had stopped being important to me. Um, I wanted to be, when I was a kid, a professional artist because my dad told me when I was little that I could be anything I wanted, including president of the United States, but I was really talented at art and I could be a professional artist. And somewhere in the back of that mind, it embedded that that was what I was going to do when I grew up. I was going to be a famous artist. And that was actually, that was his words. I could be a famous artist. <laughs> and at the time that I, you know, got out of high school. Uh, I, I put together a couple of little indie business type things. Um, one where my brother and I were, uh, doing t-shirt designs together. Uh, I went, I worked for a, a sign painter and learned how to paint signs and then tried to set myself up as my own sign painter. And I just, because I didn't enjoy working for him, but I also didn't enjoy working for myself. And I realized the problem with this was not that, uh, that I didn't enjoy, uh, or that I wasn't getting famous. It was that I didn't like the work. I did not like the smell of paints and paint thinners. And, uh, I did not like being working in a cold studio with a space heater. And I didn't like, um, just yeah, I like that. Yeah, well, yeah, that's. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can't smell the paints or paint thinner, but yeah, well, that's nice. But yeah, um, there is. If you don't like the work, it's not your job to like the work because somebody told you you're good at it. Yeah, or because you used to like it, or because you used to like it, right? And you know, I let go of two things that were my my identity. These were the person I was. I was a pending rock god. And I was a pending famous artist. And I, there was, the, and when I let go of both of these, I had this vast abyss for several years. And I went to nursing school because I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I, I, I lost everyone I had been. And there was nothing in place to fill that void. There was just nothing there. And, uh, so I became a nurse and I was a pretty good nurse. And then I was, you know, I was reading this interview with Anne McCaffrey in which she was talking about that being the way that she had managed to stay home with her kids. 
And I thought, well, okay, I used to be good at writing. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I could figure out a way to do that. And I like science fiction, maybe. And um, I started writing, and I set a goal for myself to write a novel, and I wrote a novel in one year. And, and I found something that I loved. I didn't, I, and I never thought of myself as right. It was one of the things that amazed Matt, is that he thought that was something I always wanted to do. No, it wasn't. It was yeah, just. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. You just learned that recently. Yeah. So who you were is not necessarily who you're going to be. And you get to look at your life at any point and say, okay, well, this is who I thought I was going to be, but this isn't who I want to be. And then you, and then you have the rather exciting and challenging thing ahead of you of figuring out, well, <laughs> who and what do I want to be now? And that can be hard. And that takes us to the last of the answers that writing won't fix. And that one is, I don't have a system. And if you don't have a writing system, then writing will not fix not having a writing system. It will just, you will just find yourself constantly running into walls until you start figuring this stuff out. Yes, you know, having a writing system is, um, it, it, it's not required, but holy crap, does it make big difference. Maybe <clears throat> maybe we can have a, a podcast episode on, how, like, writing your own, or having your, building your own writing system and stuff. Yeah. We'd have to see if, if people were interested in that, but I think it's, I think, um. Okay. Yeah, so if, yeah, if you're interested, you know, we'll have the, you can comment on the, the blog which, you know, we have the links at the end of the episode, but it's alone and invis- alone with invisible people.com. And then um, better place to probably put it would be in the forums. Yeah, we at Holly's really. Classes.com. We both read the forums regularly. So if this is. Yeah, every day. Yeah. How, if, if how to build your writing system is an episode you'd like, let us know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah probably the best place, Holly's writing classes.com. Um, if you don't already have a free account, just sign up for your free account and then look for the podcast forums and then look for the episode title, which will be, you know, how to write when you don't feel like writing. Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, now you're pretty much at the takeaway right now, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I have um, kind of a question. Like, and this is something that when I was younger, I didn't run into quite as much because, you know, it was it was the fan fiction, but I did have one, one story that I was posting that was a cliffhanger story. It was called Furious Angels. I was trying to post, um, a little bit every single day. And I would get to the point where a couple of times I just didn't feel like writing, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't this overwhelming thing that we've been talking about today where you didn't like what you're writing or where you're lost or anything like that. But I just didn't feel like starting up the computer and writing. So, you know, I might, go find a book or go read or something like that. I think that a lot of people think that inspiration has to come first Mm -hmm. instead of sitting down and letting inspiration find you working, which is that quote from, I think, Picasso. Yeah. Yeah. That's so it's the, there, I know that like some people, they like, like for me with art, I like to do certain things to get myself in the mindset like of, of creating art. Like I have a certain music station that I like to listen to on Pandora. Um, the same thing with writing or I have, I don't know. I, I think the 10 minute timer thing that you have that you've mentioned and that we turned into a challenge. Mm-hmm. I know that that really does help a lot of people, but sometimes sitting down at the, at your writing space if you create like a writing space for yourself, yeah, where it's it's kind of holy and you don't want you know anything else to get in that area, it's it's treated as you know with respect. That can be enough to get your juices flowing, just sitting down and turning on the computer. Yeah, that's or, your muses. It, <clears throat> I read I read something by somebody who so I don't believe in the muse. It's one of the in one of the books I'm actually <laughs> going to recommend um, for other reasons. 
But uh, the, the writer of this says, well, I, you know, I don't believe in the muse or anything mystical like that. There is absolutely nothing mystical about your muse. Yeah, she just has a misconception about what a muse is. Right. Your muse is your right brain. It is yeah. this part of you that does not have words, but that operates with pictures and concepts and, and little pushes and hints. And, and it feels like magic, but it isn't. It is just it is just the two parts of your brain communicating through this band of fibrous tissue called the corpus callosum and passing messages back and forth. And if, and your right brain is the part of your mind that you have to access when you sit down to write fiction, because that's where all the cool shit comes from. And there are a multitude of different ways that you can do this. Uh, for me, uh, I have trained my brain to show up to a timer. Uh, but there is a process that I go through to, to just get started. And this is not the same as how to build your writing system. This is just the process of getting your butt in the seat and getting things uh, set up. I have uh, a, a little document thing that I click that brings up my document. Well, you have your shower too. You can't oh, write without your shower. Yeah, first. exactly. Right. I absolutely, I have to have my shower first thing in the morning and then that, and then I go get my coffee. Used to be no coffee. I didn't even start drinking coffee till I was 56 years old. Um, and now, now, you know, I must have my coffee in the morning, but, um, so I get my, my shower, I get my cup of coffee. I sit down at my desk. I turn on my, my computer. I bring up my document. These are, there are no exceptions to this. I do not check email first. I do not um, see if there's any post on the forum. I do not, when I have had my shower, I have my coffee, I sit up and do, and, and I have this thing where I just, this is what I do next. I bring up my document, I bring up my timer, and then I make sure that I am on the right place in the document because I use Scrivener and there are chapters and I make sure that I have my, my chapters. I read through the last um, maybe half a page of what I wrote previously so that I'm back in voice. Uh, I know what, what the story and the characters and stuff sound like, which uh, this doesn't sound like that big a deal. And if you're writing the same book every day, it isn't. But if you're writing three separate novels in the same week, um, getting back in voice is very important. So, so that's what I do. And then I turn on my timer and I start writing. And, you know, there are videos of me doing this where I, I do a screen capture and I'll talk through it and you can hear the timer and you can see me writing and you can see that it starts a little slowly because even though my right brain knows the system, it'll occasionally amble instead of running to show up when I'm ready. It'll amble in after a little bit and you can see me typing a few words and backspacing and typing a few words and backspacing and, and all of a sudden, Something will click and boom, off I go. That's what I do. What you do is up to you, but it, it requires butt and chair. That is the absolute first thing you got to do. You got to get your butt in the chair. You have to sit there. You have to open up the document and not do anything else. And if you have to sit there and stare at the computer for 10 minutes or 15 minutes doing nothing, Sooner or later, your muse is going to go, wow, this is really boring. Hey, how about we write this? And you will have some sort of an idea. You will get some words. You will start being a little bit creative. And the more you get, your muse gets this pos positive reinforcement of, hey, my, my, my writer is listening to me. I'm actually getting to do shit. This is cool. The faster your muse will show up the next time. And just to make this, just to clarify, when Holly says bring up the document and do absolutely nothing, she doesn't mean don't pull out like a bio and try to add something in there if you think that's missing or don't look at the outline and try to remind yourself where you wanted this to go. She means don't check email, don't play with your phone. Right. Don't, don't you know, play solitaire. Bring up fri <laughs> free cell. I was going to say free cell. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> yeah. So don't, don't fart around with shit that isn't writing. If it's writing involved with this story that you're working on now, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and with that, um, I think I'm, I'm ready for the takeaway unless you've got something else to say. No, no, that was it. Okay, well, then let's do the takeaway here. First, figure out why you aren't writing. 
you know, ask yourself questions until one of them clicks. Uh, and we went through the questions before. So why isn't it fun now? Um, why don't I know where I'm going? Why don't I like where I'm going? Where could I go? Why don't I care where I'm going? What could change? What could I change to make me care? Um, am I unhappy? Am I bored? Am I sick? Am I exhausted? Am I clinically depressed? Am I on medications that block my creativity? Do I like what I'm writing? Do I have a system? And like I said, you know, if you guys are interested in do I have a system, um, we can do that as a future episode, but let us know. Okay, so those are the questions. Once you have those, once you have asked the questions, fix all of the fixable issues. Finally, ask yourself why you want to write in the first place and make sure you're using your life in ways that will bring you joy. If writing does not make you happy, don't do something that makes you miserable but be out of a sense of obligation to whatever, to whatever you think you owe the world. Nobody owes the world a book. Nobody, not ever, not for any reason. Nobody owes the world a book. You write a book because you love to do it. And you wait for people who love what you have written to find you when you're done. But there is no obligation in this whatsoever. There is no duty. It is if you were born with seven different kinds of talent, that's awesome. And if you don't want to use any of them, that you get to do that. You get to say, no, that's not the way I want to use this life because you only get one. And the objective in life is to find your joy and, and live inside of whatever it is that gives you joy. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> I think this was a really good episode. I think it was an important one to speak on. And I hope that we didn't come across as too um, dour in certain areas because I just think that it is a really, really important thing to ask yourself if you are writing for the right reasons, or if you see yourself, if you have that identity for the right reasons, because most people I think do, I think that it's most people that are writing that are actually doing the work. I really think they have it down for the right reason. So you just to wrap this up, I want to say if, if this is you, if you are someone who truly loves writing, then this is the best damn job in the world, bar none. It yes. is awesome. Seriously, I have been doing this for more than 30 years now, and I roll out of bed in the morning excited to go to work. I love going to work in the morning. It's awesome. And if you can find your way to that place, then God, do it, do it, because the, you, there cannot be too many writers in the world. Can't happen. And if you love this, live the life you want to live and love it. Hell yeah. All right. So that has been our episode on how to write when you don't feel like writing. If you are interested, again, in the um, how to you know build your own writing system is an episode you know let us know again the best places on the forums that's holly's writing classes.com and again the the account that you can have for yourself is free completely free you get how to write flash fiction that doesn't suck a three-week course for free as well but it's just a really great place to interact with other listeners with holly and myself with other writers and become part of the community. You can also leave comments on the blog at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. Um, but again, at most people go to the forums. You can follow us on the socials at Instagram or Twitter at A-I-A-R-W-I-P. And you can find us on Facebook at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. Um, we do have two options for supporting the podcast. We have a one-time option at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. It is on the top right hand of the website and you can pick one of three different areas in which you wish to support us. Uh, that is, I think it's five, 10 and $15. And then we also have a monthly support at the Patreon. It is alonewithinvisiblepeople.com or A-I-A-R-W-I-P. And we are still working on the first reward um, it has taken a little bit of a hit. I was hoping to have it out for the 1st of March. Um, I had already written a lot of the text, but I wanted to double check on it and add a little bit more and clarify some things. And then I got sick. So yeah, you I have apologize for that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, 
um, did go to the hospital. So <laughs> if, and had if to have an IV. Needs, and yes, yes. Yeah. If anybody needs a hospital doctor's note, I've I've got one. <laughs> um, you could also support Holly by buying her fiction anywhere um, online, pretty much that. Uh, will, you can find it on Amazon, Smashwords, Kobo. Just look up Holly Lyle and there's a ton of stuff. You can support her by buying her classes at hollyswritingclasses.com or you can support her at her Patreon. She also has three different tiers. It's uh, $1, $2, and $5. Just look up Holly Lyle, L-I-S-L-E, and you can find her on the Patreon. Again, we have all of these links available in our show notes every week at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. And if you need to contact us for anything, you can contact us at show at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. Thank you very much for listening. We adore all of our listeners. And that's it for me, Holly. Thank you very much. I'm glad we got to spend this time with you. And uh, I hope that we get to hang out again together next week. And now a word from our sponsor. You want to write, you love words, you love fiction, but you don't know where to start or how to middle or where to finish. I do. I'm Holly Lyle, and I've been doing this professionally since 1991. And I know how I did what I did to go pro and I'll be happy to show you what I've learned. Start with my free three-week flash fiction class at hollyswritingclasses.com.